The Tesla Model S Plaid is the first and only production car I've ever seen that accelerates better than it decelerates. In other words, when you hit the go pedal, it goes forward very quickly, but when you hit those brakes, it's not quite the same. Hello everyone and welcome. In this video, we're talking about whether or not the Tesla Model S Plaid has crap brakes. Now, if you haven't yet seen it, the wonderful channel Throttle House recently did review the Model S Plaid, and one of their main concerns with the Model S Plaid was the lack of brakes. So in this video, we're going to break down the numbers and talk about how it is possible to accelerate faster than you decelerate. So let's start with the first question, does the Plaid have crap brakes by comparing it to its most natural competitor, the Porsche Taycan Turbo S. So the Taycan Turbo S having a peak horsepower of 750 versus the Model S Plaid significantly more at 1,020 horsepower. The Taycan Turbo is heavier at 5,100 pounds versus the Model S Plaid at about 4,800 pounds. Uh, but really I think the power is the more important factor here when it comes to braking. Uh, we'll get into why in a moment. So the Porsche having 16.5 inch rotors up front, brake rotors, pretty massive, 16.1 in the rear, versus the Tesla's 15 inch up front, 14.4 in the rear. So Taycan turbo brakes significantly larger, 1.5 inches in the front, you know, about 1.7 inches in the back larger. So significantly larger brakes. Now, does that mean everything? Well, look at a Ford F350. This is a vehicle that weighs seven, thousand pounds 14.3 inch brakes up front and in the rear so the tesla is bigger both the front and the rear than a 7,000 pound truck right so these aren't small brakes by any means but something to take into consideration is braking is all about kinetic energy right the car is moving really fast and you have to put that kinetic energy somewhere where do you put it you put it in the brakes so kinetic energy one half mv squared a model s plaid traveling at 150 miles per hour has about 50 percent more kinetic energy than a ford f350 traveling at 100 miles per hour you have that velocity squared so that's very important the plaid is capable of going very fast so it's going to be putting a ton of energy into those brakes a ford f350 hopefully you're not driving Driving, you know 150 200 miles an hour it's gonna be pretty sketchy uh, and you're gonna run out of brakes for sure so you know it's just not something you do in a truck versus this claim top speed 200 miles per hour so a lot of that is all about how much energy can you get rid of and we're looking at larger carbon ceramic brakes on the Porsche Taycan versus smaller cast iron brakes on the Model S Plaid so it certainly is underbraked in comparison to a Taycan Turbo S. Now, what about braking performance? Well, 60 to 0 on the Taycan Turbo S takes 103 feet, 104 feet for the Plaid. So on the road, you know, pretty much identical stopping distances. Uh, on the road, these brakes are fine. 104 feet is good. It's not a bad number. Uh, the best car, production cars, uh, are getting, you know, around 88 feet. That's using better tires and they're lighter cars. Um, so considering that we're at 104 feet, pretty good braking for the road. Nothing to, to look at and be like, oh, that's embarrassing. Great brakes for the road. As far as the track, now one interesting thing to look at as a comparison uh, is lap times. So lap times on the Nurburgring for the Porsche Taycan Turbo, not the Turbo S, so the less powerful version, did a 742 on the Nurburgring versus the Model S Plaid, it did it in 736. Now that was claimed to be a completely stock car, so stock brakes. Now, something worth mentioning, so I mean, looking at that, fairly similar numbers, right? It has a lot more power, uh, it's 670 for the turbo, so significantly more power, and you know, kind of close, six second gap there with them. So it's able to do it, right? It's able to do that lap time quickly. One of the things Road & Track pointed out uh, is that they are lifting and coasting at some of the ends of those long straights. So why would you lift and coast at the end of a long straight if you're trying to set the fastest time possible? Not a great idea, but perhaps it is being done to save those brakes. There could be other reasons relating to the battery, but perhaps it is under braked and that's why they're doing it. So for the track, would I say that these are phenomenal track brakes? No, I definitely wouldn't say they are. You can find smaller, lighter, slower cars that are using much larger brakes on them. The big problem with the Model S Plaid brakes is that it has so much power, right? So it's able to get up to speed really, really quickly. Then you have all this mass, all this energy, and you have to put it somewhere. And so if you keep cycling that, that's a ton of energy going into those brakes. And they're not that big in comparison to some other vehicles out there. So under brakes for the track, yeah, I would probably say so. That said, I don't necessarily think this is a track car, right? It's not a track car. So if you are gonna take it to the track, probably worth upgrading the brakes. 
Now that leads us to our second and much more complicated question, how in the world does this thing accelerate better than it breaks? So the numbers are 0 to 60 on an unprepared surface in 2.28 seconds, requiring 98 feet to do it, versus stopping from 60 to 0 takes 104 feet, so an additional 6 feet there uh, in 0.1 second, 2.38 seconds to stop. So the thing here we need to think about is traction versus power limited. Most cars are traction limited when braking, power limited when accelerating. This Tesla is in a very rare spot where it is traction limited in both scenarios, whether it's accelerating or whether it's braking. So your tires don't care, right? Whether you're accelerating, whether you're braking, they've got about 1.2 Gs, you know, we're talking good tires here, that they can use to accelerate or brake. Now for a Toyota Corolla, you're driving at 60 miles per hour, you slam on the brakes, it only takes 119 feet, right? It's traction limited. The tires are the limiting factor to stop. But when you try to accelerate that Toyota Corolla to 60 miles per hour, well, it takes over eight seconds. It doesn't have a ridiculous amount of power to accelerate very quickly. So the Tesla has that combination of an absurd amount of power and, you know, it has brakes that work. So that is a very rare combination uh, that something has that much power and is actually traction limited all the way up to 60 miles per hour. They're averaging 1.23 Gs for that first zero to 60. That is pretty incredible versus averaging 1.16 Gs while decelerating. The closest I have seen to something having these numbers reversed like the Tesla does is the Porsche 911 Turbo S doing zero to 60 in 98 feet, same distance as uh, the Tesla here, except a little bit slower, about 0.2 seconds slower, and 60 to zero in 97 feet. So it is able to brake just slightly better than it accelerates, one foot. So why, why is it doing this, right? Well, some people will say things like, oh, you know, the tread pattern has a different way, whether you're accelerating or whether you're decelerating, it's acting on the ground in a different manner. Uh, some people will say, well, the rear tires are larger, right? That explains it. Uh, easier to accelerate where you put most of the weight on those rear tires versus when you're braking, you've got those smaller front tires that are doing most of the work. I don't think this is really the issue here. I don't think these are the big factors that are playing into why these numbers are the way they are. So the first part of this explanation has to do with anti-lock braking systems versus traction control. And so we have a graph here to help understand this. And I wanna be very clear in that I made up this graph. This is not a perfect demonstration of any vehicle out there. I spoke with several engineers to understand the logic behind this, uh, but the graph itself is just a tool to help understand what's happening with the car. So what are we looking at? Well, we have a dotted line right here, which is our available grip, meaning you're driving down the road and there's a certain amount of grip between the tire and the road. Your car doesn't know what that level of grip is, right? It has to figure it out. And so what happens is when you floor it in that electric vehicle, you request a certain amount of torque to apply down to the ground, right? You're saying, hey, give it all this torque. So it's trying to figure out, well, how much grip do I have and how much torque can I put down? So it searches, it searches, it sends more and more torque, and then eventually your tire starts to spin, right? And when you start to spin, it's like, uh-oh, we sent too much torque to the ground, we wanna lower how much torque we send. And you have this little corrective action occur, and then it tries to stay just below that available grip, right? So you can get the maximum acceleration possible. Now ABS is gonna do the same thing, uh, but kind of in reverse, right? As you slam on the brakes, it's trying to figure out, hey, how much grip do we have on this surface? So it gives you more and more braking force, more and more braking force. Eventually, you start to lock those wheels up too much, right? And so as you start to lock those wheels up too much, their speed of rotation uh, you know, decelerates, well, as that wheel starts to lock up, you say, oh, we went past our available grip, we wanna come back down. And you're hunting to go just below uh, that available grip. Same thing with a combustion engine as you're accelerating, right? Except the response time is even slower here because there's so many factors involved with changing how much torque does that combustion engine deliver. Uh, an EV is much better at doing this. So you have a bit longer and more delayed reaction here to finding that correct perfect little spot where you wanna set your torque at so that you can accelerate perfectly and stay just below that available grip. So if you look at response times for these different systems, an EV may have a response time of about 50 milliseconds, ABS at 70 milliseconds, combustion engine could be 100 to 250 milliseconds. So realistically, an EV is gonna do a much better job of this, you know, two to five times quicker in reacting, meaning it's finding that perfect little spot uh, quicker than ABS or uh, an internal combustion engine. 
And so when this is tested, when Motor Trend does this test and they get these numbers uh, that I've posted here, they're starting that test at about 60.5 miles per hour. And then they slam on the brakes and you have you know, that ABS trying to figure out, hey, where do I go? So that's included within the test, that figuring it out uh, of where is my grip. And so because of that, you're gonna have that slight amount of you know, extra distance that you travel while braking as that ABS figures out, hey, where's the perfect spot to sit our uh, you know, braking force at? And if you zoom in, these aren't you know, perfectly straight lines. They're actually changing and it's always trying to figure out where is it at, uh, but it gets very close and it tries to stay in that region uh, once it figures out what your grip is and it doesn't have slip occurring. So that's part of the explanation, right? The electric car figures it out quicker. It saves time in doing so, getting to that uh, desired grip and accelerating versus the ABS may take a little bit longer to do so and not predict it quite as perfectly and it can't react as fast. Now, one thing you might be wondering is how in the world did Porsche do this so well? You know, these numbers are almost identical. How are they able to do that if it takes so long for an engine to correct uh, and find, you know, how much actual power can we put down? Okay, change the torque level. How do they do that? Well, a couple things here. First of all, they're going to run multiple, you know, braking tests and accelerating tests in order to get that perfect number. So this is going to be, you know, idealized. It's not going to be like every time this is what you get. Second of all, Porsche does something very clever. And so if you launch in one of their cars, what you'll notice is they have dual clutch transmissions and you'll feel that clutch slipping. So the RPM will stay high. You'll hear it. You'll see that, you know, the engine isn't really dropping that much in revs and it's allowing the clutch slip to figure out the traction rather than the engine. So you're more dependent on that hydraulic actuation of the clutch rather than the actuation of your engine and saying, oh, we've provided too much torque from our engine. Let's cut that back. You can react quicker using that clutch slip. Uh, and so that's what I think gives kind of a, a reason of why these numbers here are so close and they have a very clever launch control methodology. So ABS versus traction control, that's part of the story, but the other part of the story is what I'm going to call the Corvette effect because this is a vehicle that demonstrates something uh, pretty clearly. So understeer is a good thing in the eyes of car manufacturers. Why? They don't want you to oversteer, meaning the side of the car swings out, the back of the car swings out, you run into a tree, it hits you from the side. Uh, instead, they want you to plow forward if you lose grip, right? So the car stays facing the direction you're heading. Uh, you may run into something, but you've got all that area in front of you to keep you safe. So car manufacturers like understeer just a little bit because it's safer than oversteer. So one of the things that happened that's very interesting is when we switched from the C7 Corvette where the engine was towards the front versus the C8 Corvette where the engine was towards the back, uh, we had a 50-50 weight distribution. Now we've got a 40-60 weight distribution, meaning more weight on those rear tires. The C7 also had older tires, an older generation of tires versus the C8 gets newer tires. And yet the C7 has a better braking distance, 60 to zero and 90 feet versus 60 to zero and 97 feet. So what's going on here? Uh, I actually spoke with Corvette engineers and I was like, hey, why did your braking distance get worse when theoretically you've got better tires, you've got better weight distribution, meaning the rear tires are doing more braking, so you're better distributing where that braking is occurring, so it should be better overall. And it's not, right? You've got another seven feet here. So why is that the case? Well, because they want to build in a little bit of understeer. So why is that? Well, if you have your mass located in the back, right, and you slam on those brakes, so you have your weight shift forward, your mass is of course still, you know, where it is. So that engine's still in the back and you apply a steering input. Well, when you apply that steering input, if these rear tires were at the limit and you have all this weight in the back, well, then the back's gonna wanna come around the second you start turning because you've taken the load off the rear tires, you've got a lot of weight back there, and so you provide that steering input and it slides around. So how do you fix that? Well, you slightly reduce the amount of braking that you have in the rear. So they're not quite at lockup, right? They're not just barely below that line. You leave a little buffer so that when you turn, you still have grip available for rotating the car rather than sliding around. So that helps explain why it went from 90 feet to 97 feet, a little bit worse braking. These are both extremely good numbers, right? The Corvette can brake, that's no issue, but slightly worse 
because they build in so that you don't have that instability under braking. Uh, so clever you know, way of kind of getting around an oversteer problem with a car that has the engine towards the back. So the same sort of logic can apply to this Tesla Model S Plaid. It doesn't have quite the same weight distribution like the C8, 48% in the front, 52 in the rear. But again, think about what's happening under acceleration where you're putting all the weight on the rear of the car, you're lightening that front end. If you provide a steering input, you've got that really light front end. It doesn't have the grip to turn, and so you understeer. Safe condition. Now, what happens when we slam on the brakes? Well, we shift that load forward, so now we've got a really light rear end, not much you know, load on those rear tires, and so if we were to provide a steering input under that load, that rear end is light, and you're providing, you're saying, hey, turn and do some braking when you're already at the limit, and that's gonna cause you to over Steer. You don't want that oversteer to happen from a safety perspective, so you dial it back a little bit. You take back a little bit of the braking so that in a straight line, it's not perfect, uh, but it won't allow you to get rotated too much under braking. It'll keep you nice and stable. So that's kind of the logic, and I think these are really the two big reasons uh, between these two here that explain uh, why this very strange thing occurred where it is able to accelerate quicker than it breaks. Pretty wild. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.